Thank you. Now, Pete, you're in town. Um, you're playing at Brooklyn Electronic Music Festival, and uh, you've been really, really busy with your Ibiza Classics project. And I know we uh, had the opportunity to talk about it before, but I'd and it's got such a cool story behind it. I would, I would love it if you could share it with um, everyone who's, who's tuned in as to how that came together. Yeah, basically, um, something completely different for me. Obviously, been in music all my life, both behind the scenes and as a DJ, and got the opportunity in 2015, where I got invited to um, basically curate uh, a classical concert in the UK. They call it a prom because there's a there's a there's a series of classical concerts that are held at the Royal, Royal Albert Hall every summer. They actually run for a month. Been running, believe it or not, for a hundred years, and they wanted to contemporise. Um, the idea and engage a younger audience. So they asked if I was um, interested in uh, putting together a concert. I got introduced to Jules Buckley and the Heritage Orchestra. I knew, I knew about them, but I'd never worked with them before. And we spent the first six months of 2015 kind of working out how to do it. I'd, I'd never done anything like that before. Kind of had mad, crazy ideas of we were going to do 70 tracks in 70 minutes, and then we kind of sobered that down to, to about 20. Um, and then what, what I, I basically plan it like a, I effectively like a DJ set. I wanted to reflect both the kind of nighttime side of Ibiza and, and the, um, the kind of sunset daytime side of Ibiza. So I wanted the, the, the show to ebb and flow. And obviously we're in this very historic venue, the Royal Albert Hall, it's an incredible place to play. And, um, and Jules, what he does is he, he best, basically spent the best part of six months writing out um, all the parts for the 65 people in the orchestra, so it's a 65-piece orchestra. And yeah, we, yeah, we performed it on the 29th of July. The BBC filmed it beautifully, and um, we had an amazing time doing it from like halfway through the first song, the whole, you know, 5,000 people in the Royal Albert Hall kind of stood up and started clapping. And we thought, you know, this is, this is gonna go pretty well. <laughs> And we got backstage at the end of it. It's like we were, everyone was buzzing, but we didn't. We didn't. That was it. It was like an appointment to do a show. It was. It was never a plan to do any more. But the the um, the event kind of went viral. Um, a lot of people started saying over the preceding days and weeks, you know, why weren't we there? Why didn't we know about it? Did you see this? Um, and and it built up real momentum for us to do it again. Um, so, f so then we went into last year, and eventually I was able to. So it's, it was a really difficult thing to organise, like moving 65 people around. It's quite, an ex you know, it's, quite, it's a big production. You have got to find a big place to do it. So we we didn't really know what the demand was. Um, in March, we an I announced that um, we were going to do one show at the O2, which is a bit like playing the, um, you know, the the uh, Brooklyn. You know, it's like an arena here, like 18,000 people. And if we, we we worked out if we sold half of it, we'd we'd, we'd be okay. And within 24 hours, we sold the whole thing out. Um, so then we quickly managed to get a show in Manchester and, and a show in Birmingham. So we had a run of three shows. And, and, and by then, there was that much interest that we were able to go and make an album, um, which basically was a kind of proper recording of what I'd, what I'd done the year before. So um, worked with a guy called Mark Ralph, and, and um, he was a great producer. And we were able to go into There's not many studios left in, in the UK where you can actually record orchestras in that way. One of them's Abbey Road, and the other one's um, Air Studios. So we did it. We did it in Air, Air Studios. So, album came out, and again, it was um, amazing reaction. Went the album went to number one in the UK on the pop chart, which was kind of bizarre. Um, and it stayed there for quite a few weeks until Ed Sheeran put his record out this year. And uh, and again, that gave us momentum into the third year. So this summer's been very busy, as the, the demand um, was there for us to go and do festivals. I found myself playing opposite Jay-Z with an orchestra and um, you know we played we took it to Ibiza for the first time which was amazing and um, yeah happy to say finally we worked out how to get it to the US it's not it's not unfortunately coming to New York yet but it's going to come to the Hollywood Bowl on the the 9th of November and that uh, that album is called Classic House correct yeah. the first yeah, album was first called album. Classic House and the second album is um, called Ibiza Classics <laughs> so makes sense because the show's called Ibiza Classics so so we've been we've, we've also been recording a second album. Yeah, I love the concept. You know, we've obviously all came up with the the concept of classic rock and and uh, dance and electronic music has now been around for long enough that there are generations that have you know aged and and have so many memories tied to to these you know um, uh, classic songs. Um, talk a little bit about why you think uh, that concept resonated uh, as as uh, as widely as it did. I mean. I, I I was coming here particularly as a kid 
just starting out um, in the 80s, got, got a job in the record business. I was, I was DJing, but I had, I had to get a proper job as well. And I was coming over here at the time, lucky enough to go to Paradise Garage before it closed. And, and through my contacts kind of on the streets of New York, um, kind of discovered house music here because, because people were bringing it down here from Chicago. And um, so I've always been, you know, I've always loved that kind of music. I, I was there at the beginning. Um, a lot of those, I mean, the, the history of house music without getting too deep really came 10 years after disco was kind of shot and, you know, put to bed, <laughs> um, burnt in baseball stadiums. You know, America kind of suddenly turned its back on disco at the, the beginning of the 80s. And, um, you know, six or seven years later, house music emerged. And it was really made by, you know, underground kids from Chicago um, and, and to a certain extent New York. Um, but really making records for the first time with the new technology that was available at the day. Disco was actually made by proper orchestras. House music was really, um, you know, kids' interpretation, influenced by disco, but making them for the first time on like a 303, Roland 303, you know, 808, 707, you know, 909, um, you know, drum machines, early keyboards that actually had string pads. So instead of having an orchestra, you played a string pad. And, and, and a lot of those compositions were were made, you know, in that kind of innocent, kind of naive, you know, do do whatever it takes way. But they wrote amazing parts. And so to come back, you know, pretty much 30 years later and get an orchestra, you know, 65 piece orchestra to play tracks like Strings of Life or Knights of the Jaguar or Promised Land by Joe Smooth, um, they, they translate in an amazing way. And that was probably the biggest um, motivation for me to do this, to really add kind of gravitas to the to the history of, of dance and electronic music because like it or not um i think the scene you know a lot of us in the in the scene we still have a little bit of a chip on our shoulder about being taken seriously it's not it's not considered to be kind of stuff that gets talked about in the rock and roll hall of fame or some, something like that but you know through my lifetime and my audience and and, and, and obviously a like-minded audience around the world now um these these tracks were the soundtracks to people's lives so that's why they resonated so well and I think that's why the idea kind of caught on in the in the way it did in the UK, and now now there seems to be interest to do it outside and around the rest of the world. So, well, very excited that you're bringing it to US soil. Yeah. And um, for for the fans out there who maybe haven't seen, uh, you know, the videos of of your previous performances, maybe tell them what what they can expect in terms of the setup at the Hollywood Bowl show. Um, well, it's 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 a 65 piece orchestra laid out in. Um, Kind of traditional way. The the orchestra I work with pride themselves on the fact that they're not a, they don't they're not a classical orchestra. They're a modernist kind of symphony orchestra. So they're very much engaged in 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 the contemporary and present day stuff. Um, they're amazing players. Actually, when when we travel here, what we'll we won't we can't afford to bring all sixty five of them. So I bring the core band, the singers, and the lead. Um, trumpet lead string player lead percussionist and then we we will work with local musicians which from an orchestral point there's it's probably one of the best you know places in the world to to get people is going is going to be Los Angeles so um and then what we what we do is what we what we've done in the UK is because again I've I'm, I spent my whole life kind of selling people the next thing turning people on to the next new thing so it was very important to me when I did this that I did it in a way that really celebrated you know today as much as yesterday so I in the UK, um, our guests have tended to, to um, our guest performers that we get up on stage to sing some of the songs and perform with us um, are, are, are kind of biased more to, to people that are breaking today. So the, in the UK, I was working with um, Ella Eyre, John Newman, um, Jesse Ware. Um, and then from a classical point of view, yeah, you know, I had Jamie Principal come over this summer and sing Your Love, which was the track he made with Frankie Knuckles back in the day. Um, Candy Statton came out and performed You Got the Love, which was amazing. Um, so we, we're, we're trying to reflect that in, in the US. Um, so I'm working on, I can't announce all the names now, but I'm working on a kind of selection of um, young and up and coming and, and established. I can, I can tell you Moby's gonna come and, and step up and perform two songs. We've been, I've been performing two of his songs for the last couple of years, so, um, he lives down the road. He, he actually launched the event with me. We walked around the Hollywood Bowl together and, and um, he told me some stories about it and um, he, he'd never played the Hollywood Bowl, so it's, he's, he's excited about doing it as well, so. And uh, you mentioned that there's the second album on the way, obviously hitting number one on, on the UK pop charts is an incredible achievement. Uh, what, what approach did you take with the follow-up? Um, 
There was a lot of discussion because there was an air of disbelief about how successful the first album had been. So at a time when you know, you're kind of celebrating getting a gold record and selling hundreds of thousands of copies, the first meeting I had in the record company in January, February, it was, it was a weird one because we were kind of meant to be celebrating, but it was like, it's never going to happen again. It was like, you can't do that. You can't, you can't, it's not going to work. You know, so you're going to sell half as many, a third as many. No one's going to work that. So I kind of took, took that all on board. And um, it, it, I, had, I had some ideas of what we wanted to do differently, but it's kind of morphed into a, a much more feature-led um, record. So predominant, you know, the, the first album was predominantly instrumental, showing off the orchestra, of course. The second album is much more... Um, I've picked song. I've picked certain tracks, and I've I've gone to the original artist to kind of get their blessing to to um, to perform them. I'll give you an example um, with the Chemical Brothers. We, we, we've done Galvanize, and the the original vocal of that was by Q-Tip. Um, so I don't I didn't want to repeat what had already been done. I didn't want to just go and get Q-Tip to do it again and then just put it back out as an orchestral version. So we got a guy called Reggie Snow. Um, it was actually amazing, it's kind of on the UK rap scene, verging on the grime scene, actually from Ireland, but lives in New York. Um, so he's, you know, he's an up and coming guy breaking in the UK. He's got records on daytime radio right now. So people are excited about him. And so we've done it with him. So that's the one example. Um, I've taken Armand Van Helden's You Don't Know Me. We kind of flipped that and done it with Craig David. Um, Unfinished Sympathy, which was always perf performed by um, a female vocal. We've done it with a male vocal, Massive Attacks, probably mo their most um, iconic track. So that's the, it's, it's, it's feature heavy. Um, and there's a couple of surprises on there as well in terms of, you know, I've, I've done the kind of Pete Tong bit and kept it probably cooler than maybe other people, you know, I, my obs you know, and kind of kept it very Ibiza. So there's tracks on there that um, 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 did Dixon's partner, a track called Reg, which is probably one of the most iconic underground records ever in Ibiza. And Man With A Red Face, Laurent Garnier, um, and a track called Yeki Yeki by Murray Canty, which um, is a track I was playing like 30 years ago. It actually came from Africa, from Nigeria, and broke and still gets played to this day, actually. So, um, yes, it's, 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 it's been a lot of fun. We've done a Prodigy track, talked to Liam about it. He was very excited and helped me put together um, Outer Space. And I we went to Jamaica and got um, a guy called Assassin to do the vocal, which was originally done by Max Romeo. So um, again, we kind of flipped it. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff on there. Very cool, very cool. And uh, you just said yourself that you've always sort of been, you've been someone who's all about what's next. You know, you've, you've broken um, the careers of many, many, uh, you know, helped. major- uh, Helped. <laughs> helped, helped, uh, helped the careers of many major artists. What are you excited about right now? What are you, what are you listening to? What, what, what sort of scenes are kind of catching your interest? Um, I think anyone out there that does something really different is exciting. It, it, it feels like we're in a, very, a real kind of state of flux. Um, you know, the train was running down a kind of set, set track for quite a few years, particularly in America with the kind of explosion of EDM. It feels like that's kind of gone away now. Um, and and for, the, for, for, the, for the first time in a while, the, you know, what's working on one level in the US isn't necessarily working around the rest of the world and what's working around in the UK or Europe isn't necessarily what's working here. So it's, a, it's I personally find that a very interesting time because I kind of have an A&R background and a curiosity you know, to discover new things. So I think it's it's all up for grabs at the moment in terms of um, what what's next. You know, I think the US bass scene kind of fascinates me in one, one level of like its popularity, but it also fascinates me the fact that um, we haven't had like a massive record, you know, not not one that's kind of broken out of the genre and and turned everybody else on, um, and it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a strange but interesting time, you know. Marshmallow, you know, everyone talks about him. He's like phenomenon, you know. We like him or hate him, you know, you can't ignore him. But then his rec his his kind of breakout records with Khalid, you know, it's like it's actually much more like a Khalid record than anything Marshmallow's put out before. So. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, you know, it's just an observation. But um, in, in Europe, in, in Ibiza this year, really it was the, the underground um, kind of just was ruled basically. But again, it's, it's, it's more of feeling and an experience than I would say to you, you've got to listen to that record. I mean, there's certainly been some great records been put out. It's, you know, the whole kind of burner scene has influenced the sound with, you know, so that's that's that was hugely popular in 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 Ibiza. Black Coffee did really really well. People like Solomon, obviously Tale of Us. But again, they're not. 
you've got to be there almost to experience it rather than you know, just say, well, that's the record of the summer. I couldn't really name one. And I know that when we spoke, um, I think it was back in February, uh, you, sa you, you said that the American dance music market had become saturated. And I'd love to hear you kind of explain that. Uh, and also, um, maybe indicate what you think uh, for, for artists who are trying to break through or for, or for new event promoters who are trying to you know, uh, succeed in the current climate, uh, what, what kind of strategies should they prioritize? Well, being... That's a, that's a big question to answer. Um, because I think if you're an event runner, you've got to run great events. So, and I've always felt the greatest events in the world and the, the, the ideal position you want to get to if you're running events, like what, what we're talking about, festivals or you know, one-off parties in clubs, is that the, the, the party's so hot that you don't really care who's on. You trust the event. You know, I mean, you know, we, we all know Coachella sells out before they put the bill up. EDC does kind of used to does still um, you know certain events you know, movement in Detroit um, you know Glastonbury in England um, you know I could go on and on there's you know there's certain there's certain events that you don't really you, tr you trust the event to give you an amazing time um, and they and they go that way round so I think if you want you know that's where you want to get to so you've got to great run, run great events and obviously you want to put on great entertainment and great music you got to take risks you got to do something different I think. Referring back to the start of your <laughs> question or your point was that we did get to a, a stage, you know, a year or two ago where um, every electronic event certainly kind of relied on the same names. So they were all looking similar. You know, if you'd never been to any of them, you wouldn't know that, the, you know, the difference between Ultra or, you know, EDC or Electric Zoo because they all had the same names on the you know top of the flyer. Um, and I think that's that's where the... the it was getting overcrowded, or it, you know, it was too, there were too many events that appeared to be the same. But the market ultimately kind of levels itself out. They can't, they can't all work forever like that. So something has to give, and something has to change. So again, I think, I think people are, um, people want, people will respond. The audience will really respond if you come up with some a good idea. So it's, it's about take, you know taking risks and being inventive. So it's a little, maybe a little bit. And from a club perspective, that's probably easier in New York than almost anywhere else. You know, New York, Miami, LA to a certain extent because of the size of the cities and the amount of people available. You can take a few more risks at club level. So, but it's still it's still weird to me that Manhattan hasn't got um you know still it hasn't got a club really anymore. Not an electronic club. Everything's out in Brooklyn. So. And you're also uh, you 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 own a label. You run a label, FFRRR. Um, how has the current um, kind of streaming climate and the, the advent of Spotify playlisting and the like changed your approach as a label head? Um, again, I think you, you're kind of learning again. I mean, it's a very exciting place to be again, that's for sure. It's, it feels like the kind of heat's returned. Being, being in the music business again um, is, is quite an exciting place to be. I think there's finally revenue streams are coming back out of um, Spotify and Apple. People are starting to get paid. Things are starting to sort themselves out again. And 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 um, if you have a big success on, you know, Spotify, you can. It's it's certainly converting to tickets as well. I mean, I think that was the first thing that came out of SoundCloud. Is you had this, this kind of wave over the last couple of years of, you know, SoundCloud artists converting to Spotify artists that could build up, you know, a few million streams, and suddenly they'd find that they could sell 500 tickets or a thousand tickets across America. So that was that was that was kind of stage one. And now, beyond that, you know, you're seeing records obviously stream. I was, I mean, in fact, I've got a meeting with Spotify this afternoon. But I think one of the most successful global records is the Jax Jones record um, with Ray on it. And that's actually we've been performing with the orchestra as well, but. I think he's he's done nearly 300, 000, 300 million streams of that. Um, so that's actually that's good business. That's a big that's that's probably one of the biggest international hits. Um, so I think it's um, <laughs> it's again it's again it's it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to um, to 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 get your music out there. And I think it's ultimately it's it's, it's a really healthy thing because I think you know. Music that was kind of that had to, you know, the, gate, the gatekeepers of the media before were traditional radio outlets or whatever, and um, it's it, it kind of corked the bottle to a certain extent. And, and then all top 40 s stations in um, when I, I moved to America four years ago, and I obviously spent my whole life on Radio One, and I'm a big fan of radio, so I do travel and listen to radio, but moving to LA was quite interesting. Like, got 
got in the car for the first time, <laughs> first day, drove down the highway. You know, like, the first 30 minutes of any radio station is almost like, wow, it sounds so slick. And then you realize that three weeks later, you're listening to the same four songs on repeat, <laughs> five, ten, 10 songs, and it gets a bit tiresome. And Spotify's obviously changed all that. Um, it's, no, it's no coincidence that rap, in particular, and, and the playlist like, like Rap Caviar is having such a massive effect on the, on the market um, because the, they don't have to wait to get on the radio anymore. They don't have to do clean versions. They don't, you know, and I think, you know, the, the last time I had a kind of creative conversation with, with the um, senior people at Spotify, they really said the kind of MC, you know, the MC globally has been the biggest benefactor of Spotify because they, you know, the audience finds them. So, you know, whether you're rapping in, you know, Spanish or, or Portuguese in Brazil or wherever, um, those records seem to be rising to the top. Um, look at Post Malone, you know, he puts a record out and like, and he's the fastest I've ever seen a record go to number one. I think, I think within 24 hours it was number one all over the world before he got played on the radio. He's not like, he's, I don't know if everyone would recognize him if he walked in here now, but um, so that, that shows the power of it. Um, and you can't write, you know, Apple Music, I hear more every, every week, you know, more and more people are saying to me that, um, you know, that's really settling down now, and, and, they're, they're, and that's actually, in terms of breaking artists, even, even more powerful. So um, that, that's, that's, you know, it's good that there's that competition, healthy competition. So it's, it's, it's interesting times, you know. Um, I, 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 I think about what impact it has on what I do on radio. You know, how do you fit in with that? You know, how do you get people's attention? You know, I, when I started on Radio 1, um, that was the only thing you could listen to, you know, and now... Um, 25, 26, 27 years later, um, there's so many other distractions. But people still find me, they still find Danny Mac, and we still seem to have an impact. But we con constantly got to be rethinking, thinking on our feet of what we do. The Essential Mix has been interesting because that's probably the, the show that I do that's benefited most from um, streaming on demand. Um, still a bit frustrating sometimes with the BBC because they, they, don't, they don't market the technology, but actually... I don't know how many people in this room know that the iPlayer is available for free on the App Store. You can download it and you can have the Essential Mix anytime you like. But um, that's that's still not enough people know that. So more more, more people find it on um, you know, BitTorrent sites and um, SoundCloud than they realise they actually can get it legally like through the iPlayer app. So yeah. Well, I could I could talk about music with you all day, but I think <laughs> I think we'll open up to audience questions, uh, give them a chance as well. Hi, hiya. Um, so you've been saying that you've been doing Good so teacher. much in the music and thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you've done so much in the music industry, from producing to DJing and now curating these events. So I was wondering what your favorite aspect is, and then also maybe something that you might want to delve into next. I think um, I still like DJing. I mean, I still feel everything comes from that. It's kind of I feel like I, I was always felt I was a bit of a fraud if I if I didn't do that. So that that was the very first thing I did. I, mean, I tried to be in a band first. I tried to play the drums. wasn't very good, and then um, got into DJing. So all all my radio experience was really came from being in a club. Um, I guess the thing I'm not as well known for because I when I started it was in, almost impossible to do it, is making music. So actually my hobby now, when every minute I get like when when I'm to myself is actually just trying to, you know, making music or just learning more and more about the DAW and equipment and analog equipment. So I'm, I'm always fiddling around the studio. So I think that, that, that's, and I don't really have a pressure to to do it. It's not like, you know, but I, I, I really enjoy it. So that's something I hope almost later in life I can do more of. So, and it's it's funny, we what I didn't tell you is we've actually done two original tracks with the orchestra, which has been really nice. I don't know how we're going to put them out because you can't exactly call them classic, but we've actually made two original tracks. So <laughs> watch this space. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? Um, I was wondering, you know, you've been sort of a leader of industry for so many years now in the electronic music scene. So do you sort of have any key insights as to like how you've been able to adapt in sort of like a, an industry that changes so often? Um, I think the, the adaption, I, the, the, adaptation, the adapting I did when I was younger was out of necessity. Because I wanted to be a DJ, you know. I, I, when I discovered, when I first saw a DJ at like, my school, um, I just thought, I want, I want. How how cool is that? I want to do that. Um, and so, by the time I got like two turntables and a mixer and started collecting records, I was like, well, I want to turn this into a job. But that wasn't, 
you know, DJing didn't bring in that kind of income back then. You had to go and do like bar mitzvahs or weddings. <laughs> so, I, you know, my f I, I kind of became entrepreneurial before I even understood what the word meant. So it was like, well, how am I going to like spend more of my time doing DJing rather than working in a store or like, you know, putting petrol in people's gas in people's cars? So I, I got a sound system and I, I said people should hire me, you know. And then um, eventually I got a residency in a in like a bar, and then um, and and then I was curious about like, well, what what could you do in the music business during the daytime? And that's how I, I ended up kind of interning at a record company, and then got that accelerated really really quick, and that kind of side of my career took off. So I I, I had a proper day job from like 19, you know, like when I was was like from the 80s, like all the way up to like 2000s. I wa I wasn't actually um, I, I joke with a lot of my Contemporaries like Paul Oakenfold and that and Carl Cox. So I didn't. I didn't really have become a full time DJ until about two thousand and one, two thousand and two, because I had a day job. So um, and I couldn't travel quite as much as they did. So I didn't really tr start touring heavily in 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 the US until that time, because I was always like Mon Monday to Friday. I was at the record company. So and and I and I was on the radio. So I think it was more out of necessity that I did it. And I would encourage, you know, it's even easier now. You can make. You know, you, you can. It's, it's, you can make music. You can do. You kind of do what you want to now, <laughs> but um, you definitely need to be driven. You have to have a passion, um, um, and and I guess get a feeling for where your niche is, where you feel most comfortable, most excited. Don't get too distracted. <laughs> That's the thing. I, I probably look back on my career and think, I do. I do sometimes think, what if, what if I was like a master of one trade as opposed to maybe a jack of all trades? <laughs> so, but, well, but you know. Whatever. I think, think we have time for one more question from the audience. Hi, um, I was wondering what it feels like to DJ for a huge crowd. Um, yeah, it's a you know it's a it's a buzz. I mean, I, funny enough, I I am more comfortable probably. I was always really a club DJ. I mean, I, I and I've got to play in front of some very big crowds. Probably the biggest crowd was ever ever played at was the Berlin Love Parade on the Monument, which you you're, you're allegedly can't count them, but you're allegedly playing to a million people. So that is obviously a buzz, you know, it's ego buzz, but you don't really, it's so big, you, can't, you, know, <laughs> you, don't, you don't know if they're all listening. Um, so for me, so it was always more like a 500 to two or 3,000 capacity was like my, because my, you really can feel you've got everybody. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's an amazing feeling. I guess it's, it's, it's um, kind of slightly addictive. <laughs> I always likened it to surfing, you know, that you could, I'm not a surfer, but one thing I understand is like you could I could play the same records to the same crowd in the same club every single day, and every time will be different um, because there everyone comes into that room, different things happen in their day, every everybody's different. So you never you know if you catch that kind of perfect wave, that perfect moment, you want to get it again. You might wait like weeks, months, years <laughs> before you ever get that moment again. So that's the other thing about the what it's like DJing in front of a big crowd that you're. You remember that time when you were you were at, you were on really on your game, and you and you can't ca kind of work out how to get back there quick enough. <laughs> but it's like so many moving parts. So, but it's um it's a, it's an it's an honor, and it's it's um it's yeah I feel very fortunate that that's still I'm able to do that. So. All right, well, I think that wraps it up. Thank you, Pete. Um, Thank you. You can catch Pete at Brooklyn Electronic Music Festival, and if you're out in LA, you can catch him at the Hollywood right. Bowl in November. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>